Good morning, beautiful people online, and good morning, beautiful people in person. Thank you for being here with us at Lighthouse in San Francisco. Uh, I want to open up in prayer. I want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for blessing us to be in this space today. Thank you for blessing us with technology where we can be here and we can spread throughout the earth. Thank you for that, Lord. I want to thank you for loving us. I want to thank you for meeting us where we are in our journey. I want to thank you for everything that you make possible. And as humans, we forget to say thank you. So I thank you this morning for all of it. And I thank you, Father, for using Kimberly this morning to bring forth your word and that you will open our spiritual ears to receive what you want to speak to each and every individual of us. I thank you for all of it. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you for loving us. I thank you for being patient with us. I thank you for understanding us. In Jesus' name I pray, and to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Uh, this morning I'm going to introduce Kimberly. Kimberly will be our speaker this morning. And... Um, I am blessed with Kimberly on so many levels. Uh, Kimberly walked into a lighthouse in San Francisco many, many years ago uh, to a Celebrate Recovery meeting. And since then, she has been faithful. She is a member of our church uh, family. Thank you. And for me, she is very special because she is also my prayer partner throughout the week. So I welcome Kimberly, and I thank you, God, for using her this morning. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. Oh, a different mic. It's special. to ask some people to prepare their Bibles to read, because so, I have seven verses um, prepared, and I'm going to ask for seven volunteers to read. Um, so, 
The first one is Romans 12, 2. Who wants to read that verse? Alex? Yeah. All right, Alex, you'll read Romans 12, verse 2. Just hold it, and, and I'll, I'll let you know when we're going to get to it. The second one is Colossians 3, verses 2. Do I have a volunteer to read that? TJ, thank you. Um, Galatians 6, 7 through 8. Any other volunteer? Yes, thank you. Um, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 3. Yes, yeah. What was your name again? Pat. Pat. Matt. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> Matt, thank you. Yeah, 13. 10, 13. And then 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. Yes. And what was your name again? Hey. And 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. Yes. Okay. I love the ooh. And Zechariah 4, verse 6. Any, any last volunteers? Maybe Vivian, do you mind volunteering? Sure. <laughs> Zechariah 4, verse 6. Okay, so eventually I'll have you guys read those verses um, for now. Just hold on. Um, I'm just grateful to be here today, guys, because um, there it was everything against, like, in my body that wanted to speak today. I usually like to sit and listen, um, and I like to converse. But um, whatever I have to give, I hope it's for someone in this room or someone online or someone in the future because um, I feel like the devil definitely did not want me to speak today and I almost did not and I was completely terrified, I even cried before coming here because um, this somehow is making me extremely nervous. Um, so I'm really grateful to be here and thank the Lord that I'm standing here today smiling. <laughs> Um, all right, so the theme of today is called Voices and Choices, and I know we are talking about transformation, renewal, and hope, and those three things can be very, very deep and very, very um, hard, especially if you are going through any circumstances that are very difficult to get through, or if you're going through a transformation process, or you're trying to renew your mind and make difficult choices. So for me, I titled this voice because throughout um, my life and my journey, I've been having to discern many different voices. And when I say voices, I'm talking about like thoughts or pressing feelings. It can be anxiety, depression, anger, pride. It could be thoughts of, am I going to have candy or not? <laughs> Thoughts of, am I going to watch that TV show that I know I'm going to sit in front of the TV for three hours instead of spending quality time with my family or even quality time in prayer or in reading the word? So um, there are some questions that I came up with when I was thinking and reflecting on this, and I, here, here are some of them. It's like, I'm asking you guys, what are the voices that you hear, whether internally or externally, um, whether it's a feeling or a thought? Are you following voices and thoughts of truth? Or are you following voices and thoughts of lies? What choices do you make when you hear those voices? Are these voices and choices bringing you closer or further away from truth? Truth about who you are, truth about God, and truth about others around you. Whether they're your colleagues, your friends, or your family, or just even strangers that you don't even know. How do we handle the voices that seem tormenting or the ones we cannot shut off? Do we find ways to cope, to ignore, to distract, and mishandle? Are we making healthy or unhealthy choices? Are they godly or ungodly? That's how I would say, healthy, godly, unhealthy, ungodly. Of course, if you go into the psychology of it, maybe it might be a little difference in the science of it, but if you believe that God wants all things to work out for your good, you know that it's their godly choices that you're going to be making. <laughs> Do we self-medicate? Do we lie, cheat, numb, or distract ourselves with TV? Do we give in to sexual pleasures, lusts, retail or unnecessary shopping? Gossip, 
drown our thoughts with music, or even hide in religion, in which you make the check mark of just reading your Bible, sitting at church, and telling others about God, but not really living in that truth. Do we distract ourselves any which way to get rid of this discomfort, the nagging, or the torment? Do we try to do it our own way? Do we surrender and do it God's way? Or maybe, like me, <laughs> you attempt to do a mixture of both, in which you play on this gray field of, yeah, I'm doing it God's way, but I'm going to do it my way too, and I'm just going <laughs> to lean on God's grace. Or do we turn to scripture and remember God's word? What he says about us, what he says about him, and what he says about others. And are we looking at ourselves the way he sees us, or are we looking at ourselves the way the world sees us, or society, or even ourselves, which can be quite tainted and disturbing? <laughs> so he guides us through his word. And with that, let's encourage ourselves with some scripture and the volunteers that I asked to read will read. If you don't mind taking the courage to come up here and read so that our online audience can see your beautiful faces. Oh, um, and if you don't want the audience to see your face, I'm not pressuring anyone because I don't want anyone to feel pressured. I, I got a microphone. You got a microphone? Does that mic work? Amen! Okay, let's do that. We'll do the microphone. <laughs> <clears throat> if you don't mind, I, can I read both uh, NIV and NLT? Yes, that's a great, that's great. I am glad Alex brought it up um, with the NIV or uh, what was the other one? NLT. NLT, because there's different um, translations and the translations can impact us differently. So that's, a, that's great. Thanks, Alex. Uh, and they can hear him? Romans. 12.2 in the NIV, uh, verse 2. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, mm -hmm. his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Uh, for the NLT version of Romans 12.2, don't copy the behavior of and custom of this world, mm. but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> okay, TJ. Thanks. The NLT version of Colossians chapter 3 verse 2 is think about the things of heaven not the things of earth mm, amen yeah. thank you uh, who's our Galatians 6 7 through 8 oh it's awesome oh. thank you oh uh, that's Galatians Galatians 6 uh, Gal oh Galatians Galatians 6 Six, seven through eight. Okay, seven to eight. Do not be deceived. This is uh, NIV, okay. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps that he sows. Whoever sows to please the, their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Mm -hmm. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. That's Amen. the word of God. Amen. Um. First, Matt, for First Corinthians 10, verse 13. Yeah. Yeah, First Corinthians 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Amen. Amen. Second Corinthians twelve verse nine. Second Corinthians twelve uh, verse nine. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weaknesses. 
Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ hmm. may rest upon me. Hallelujah. Amen. Um, yes, thank you for exchanging the microphone. Second Timothy one seven. Yes. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Amen. Amen. I love that. <laughs> Amen. And lastly, Vivian's going to read for us um, Zechariah four verse six. Then he said to me, this is what the Lord says to Zerubbabel. It is not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> is that good? Okay. Thank you, everyone, for participating in that. Um, so for the act of participation is especially because... It's like practicing going to the word of God when we're in trouble, practicing going into the word of God when we are being tormented or are facing difficulties and realizing when we um, grow in that factor, it's like you become mature in understanding what the word of God is saying to you. What I like to think of is like that the Bible is like full of wisdom. And then when we grow in our relationship to Christ, he gives us understanding of how to apply that wisdom. And as a little girl, like a little bit about myself, um, <laughs> I grew up in a church um, since I was very young under um, a pastor named David Wilkerson in New York City. And I was very much informed about the Bible. And so, you know, as when you have, when, if you're a parent, a responsible parent, um, and you're teaching a young one, or even a child, a babe, or for your teacher, like how to do things, they just follow instructions, right? You just like, all right, this is the, this is what I'm telling you. So it's wise of them to just listen to their authority figures, hopefully, and good standards. I know that sometimes people abuse that authority, but in the perfect world situation, we want to raise our kids to know not to touch hot things, right? Because they'll burn their finger. Something typical like that. But then when you grow older, a child might not understand, but then when they realize and, and mature, they understand like, okay, I understand why I'm being told to do this. And in the Bible, we even see like how, you know, some people are, are still like babes and you still drink milk because you, you never come to that full understanding of the wisdom. So for me and my relationship with God, it's about going to the Bible consistently and starting to understand. And it's taken a lot and it takes it every it's an everyday process it's not something that is like done overnight and sometimes you think you have it all like I have thought <laughs> and then God's like no I'm like hush child let me tell you um <laughs> so anyways um what with um all this I started thinking about courage so sometimes even when you have the knowledge and you have the understanding and you have the wisdom, it takes courage <laughs> to apply it. And it takes courage to um, tune out or say no or listen to the, the right thing, the, like God's voice, instead of these pressing matters or these habits that you might have ingrained in your life. Um, so we need courage to make these choices. And it's hard because we might have fear or there might just be temptation, or we might have guilt and shame, or hard to break habits are, is very uncomfortable. <laughs> it's extremely uncomfortable when you're like told your body that you want a certain thing, or like, I'm gonna, like, you know, I, for me, like I would practice like eating really late at night before going to bed, and you're like, why do I have trouble sleeping all the time? It's like, well, maybe you shouldn't be eating right before going to bed. But breaking those habits, as simple as it sounds, is a lot harder because it's uncomfortable. We like to have control. We like to have this feeling, this sense of comfort, of routine. Um, so when God tells you to break those things, it is not easy all the time. 
and we would have to have courage in order to trust God that he's going to allow us to be victorious and that it's okay to be uncomfortable. And that was a hard lesson for me to learn. I don't like to be uncomfortable and I, and I, um, I like to do everything I can to not be co uncomfortable. And then sometimes there was a point in my life recently that God's like, you're going to be uncomfortable and it's going to be okay because I am with you. Um, and then some days we might need to lean immensely on community. And that's something that I rely on immensely on. <laughs> As Vivian has already introduced me with coming here with Celebrate Recovery, um, relying immensely on community, on prayer. And prayer is not, um, for those that practice prayer and believe and have faith, prayer is not just like a, um, like a good luck charm. It's, it's, there's power in prayer. And I want to encourage anyone today that doesn't believe in prayer um, that it works. <laughs> prayer does work, and, and your faith will grow in prayer. And something that I recently have been doing, especially with Vivian being um, a prayer partner of mine and, and her influence is like writing it down in pr a prayer journal. So you can write your prayers down and you look back to see what was actually answered because we forget a lot of the times and us humans um, have a hard time remembering things. <laughs> sometimes we remember, we have a hard time remembering like what we ate last week um, and sometimes we have a hard time remembering what God has actually done for us and what he's gotten us through. And then we start to doubt and we start to rely on our own, um, our own strength and that is when we get into trouble. So sometimes we need um, the word of God, and there are also tools and resources and wisdom, and sometimes you get professional help. Sometimes you get a counselor, sometimes you get a therapist, sometimes it's a, it's a psychologist, sometimes you have to delve deeper into that God has provided these things for us, but you, we cannot idolize one thing because God might give you something one day and it doesn't work the next day. And you're like, darn it, why doesn't it work? Like I did this last week and it worked just fine. So let me do it again. And God's trying to teach us that we have to rely on him each and every step of the way because he might provide something for you one day that's not gonna work for tomorrow. And you have examples of that, of like when he provided uh, manna, you know, for the Israelites and he's like, do not store it up. Like trust in me to provide each and every day with new food. And what happened if they stored it up? It turned into yucky worms, right? And it actually smelled really bad. And everyone knew who didn't trust in God because there was a stench coming from their tent or something. Um, another, another example is, you know, when Jesus was with his disciples and he w was saying, um, you know, go out without swords or money and, and go and, and, and spread the, the, the word. And then later on, he said, you can go out with swords and money. So it's not one way or this way. It's like it's a consistency of our relationship with God. And that's what makes it exciting is our walk with God, our consistent walk with God. And what we have to do is die to the flesh, meaning die to our need to control, die to our need to depend on ourselves. And, um, yeah, die to that need of being independent of God, like out like not being interdependent with God. So that is like <laughs> something that I've also had to like break down in my spirit of being like, okay, I got it. I got the guideline. I got the check mark. I'm going to, I'm good. I'm going to keep going. And God's like, no. <laughs> um, so with all of that, I'm just trying to basically say, let us not ignore the word of God and let us not ignore his voice. We, Pray for discernment. Pray for discernment of the voices, of discernment of the spirits. And that is in our scripture. I, I, don't, even, I don't know if I wrote that down or if, if that was one of the things that we just um, spoke on. But um, it is ba basically, I'm not sure exactly what verse it is, but the, um, in, the, in, in the Bible it does say to test the spirits because there are false prophets and there are pro false voices and it can even sound like God. And that's the scary part, too, is that Satan knows what to do to fool us. And we see movies sometimes that Satan has this, like, you know, bad person with demons and stuff. And then we're like, no, we're going to beat you. And yes, that's true. But sometimes we undermine the power of Satan. And we have to understand that he's um, very intelligent. And he knows you maybe better than you know yourself. 
And that is the reason why we have to hold firm to God and also learn to discern the, the voices. And this is something that I also want to encourage everyone with is that there is grace. Meaning, I used to be afraid of making the wrong choices. And so I would be frozen in fear, or I would be self-righteous, um, or I would just not care. And what, the, what I've been taught, and what, what, I, what God is hopefully teaching you today, is that his grace is sufficient enough for you. So when you do make mistakes, there's grace, and there's mercy. Sometimes we have to deal with the consequences, but sometimes there is mercy and that we don't have to suffer as much. But there is grace that covers it. So don't be intimidated by making the wrong choice. And don't be intimidated. Don't allow Satan to say, like, you're no good. <laughs> you're, you're a failure. You always make mistakes. You always go back to this. You always go back to that. Because that is an accusation that is false. Because Christ has already won. He's already defeated. He did that when he died on the cross. We are forgiven of our sins, period, like once and for all. And so we live in that grace and we live in that reality. So I'm here to tell you, do not fear because there is hope. That's number one. Um, Jesus defeated death. So we can stand in that confidence. Number two, transformation is possible. I'm a working piece of art on that. And um, the renewing of your mind is a constant process. At each and every day, we have to become more and more like him. And each and every day, we make choices to do that or choices not to do that. And by God's grace, we go back to number one, that even when you choose not to go to God, he will continue to pursue you. So there's some biblical stories that I would love to delve into, but before that, um, because we were talking about the theme of stories, um, and TJ had this amazing idea, which hasn't come to fruition yet, of uh, having um, pamphlets passing out or like telling others about, you know, individual stories that we can share here at Lighthouse. Um, I'm not there yet. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I'm surprised that I'm even standing here today and smiling. Um, <laughs> Um, so this, so hopefully we can get there, but before we even delve into, like, I know Pastor Jeff Garner was talking about me possibly interviewing someone today, but that didn't come, um, to plan, and I was thinking, it's like, I need to tell a little bit about myself, which I have already, um, before asking others to even step up and talk about themselves, but as Vivian had already mentioned, how I came to Lighthouse was through Celebrate Recovery, which is still happening on Tuesday nights, and it's on the, on the phone, but it used to be here in the building, and I was recommended to a friend of mine to come to a Celebrate Recovery. There's other Celebrate Recoveries throughout the nation, um, even one in Oakland, and my friend was attending one in Oakland with his wife, and he said, maybe you should come to go to a Celebrate Recovery. I'm like, I'm not trying to go to Oakland like every day, like once a week and traveling at night. I'm like, you know, we make it seem like a big deal, like traveling over the bridge sometimes, which I'm slowly getting over, guys. So don't judge me too hard. Um, but then they were like, there's, there's one at Lighthouse. And I was like, Lighthouse, that sounds so familiar. I looked it up and it's literally three blocks from my house, two blocks from my house. And I'm like, I've passed by this place, okay. That's easy. Like, how easy can it get? God's like, there you go. <laughs> and so I walked in to celebrate recovery and sat down, and Vivian was facilitating. And some other folks um, were there, and we just started talking about how we are all addicted to sin. We are all addicted to rebellion against God. I know sin could be a trigger word for some people. So it's basic to me what I've seen as sin is a rebellion against God, re disobedience to what God has called you to do. Um, and so that, I, that suited well with me. I'm like, okay, yes, we're all addicted to sin. So it could be anything. And it could seem small to another individual, but it's big to God. And I know we like to judge based on, oh, like, how bad was it on society's terms? But like God says in the Bible, even if you look at a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery. If you hate your brother, you've already committed murder. So in the eyes of God, it is way different than in the eyes of men. And so 
I started going to Celebrate Recovery, which allowed me to go to light, come here to Lighthouse. I realized that people from Celebrate Recovery were attending church here, so I started attending church here. And, um, and it was beautiful. And I started to, to change and um, to transform, and it's been like a three, four-year process. <laughs> Um, and God used my marriage as a vehicle to change me and a vehicle to show who he was, who I was, and how I look at other people. And I had to learn how to make choices and listen to different voices or not listen to different voices or have an internal dialogue with myself and allowing the spirit to move within that. And so... With that, I plugged into community, I plugged into prayer, I plugged into practicing this discernment and knowing that I'm not perfect. Um, and then the difficulties through this process of renewal and transformation, it brings heartache, it brings um, suffering, it brings discomfort, um, and also brings the challenge of forgiving yourself and forgiving others and living by his grace and um, to consistently surrender giving up to God your will each and every day and learning that it will take time, <laughs> lots of time. And I'm a very impatient person, um, as some people that know me might um, attest to. Um, I, I like to always say, like, I come from New York City where time is money and I don't like to waste it. So coming here to California, I'm like, Oh, man, like, you were waiting in line for 10 minutes. Why don't you know your order yet? Like, why are you conversing with the barista for five minutes? Like, I've got to go. Like, what's going on? Um, and even the story of just, like, learning that I can cross the street and a car will stop. And I was like, no, 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 this is how it works. You go. I almost brushed your car, but you passed me and we're good. Not like I'm walking across the street and you wait 10 feet away from me looking at me when you have a green light and I'm like, what are you doing? Like, why are you stopping in the middle of the street? This is not how it works. So lots of cultural and social adjustments when I came out here in California. And wow, God um, has, has definitely um, renewed my mind in many ways and consistently um, have been praying and asking other people for the past year to... Um, have God renew my mind and transform me into who he wants me to become. Especially after leaving my career of being a ballet dancer for 12 years, that was something that was huge for me. Um, and I was like, what's my purpose here on earth? And I kept searching for that answer, and I'm still searching, even though God's kind of like showing me that I'm living out my purpose. Um, but I like to have like a, yeah, you know, a title and um, that's not necessarily going to be the case for me. So anyway, so <laughs> I want to continue to encourage everyone by looking into some biblical stories. And one of the, my favorites is Joshua. So in Joshua 1, 6 through 9. And I, I'm really excited to share Joshua because Vivian was the one that pointed me to Joshua um, when I, I needed the courage to ask for help. And I was praying, um, <laughs> I was like, I remember walking down the street, and I was like, Lord, I just need a woman of God to help me, to guide me, because I'm stuck, I don't know what's happening, like my identity is crumbling, I don't know who I am anymore, I don't know how I'm supposed to be representing myself in this world. I thought I knew who I was, but I don't even know who I am anymore. I just need some guidance. And I had been going to celebrate recovery for some time. And I was just, I remember walking, like, after praying this for, like, a week. And then Vivian popped in my mind. I was like, wow. I was like, how dumb. I was, I'm a little critical of myself. And I was like, that was so dumb of you. Like, of course Vivian's perfect. Like, <laughs> Why didn't you think of that before? Um, but anyway, so God was like, yes, Vivian. And so I remember I was down in Santa Cruz because I was doing a performance down there. And um, I wrote her an email. And I was like, I don't even know if this is normal. I, I didn't know this is what actually Vivian did. Like, this is what she does. <laughs> and I was like, um, would you mind, like, I don't know, mentoring me or counseling me or, or even anything, like anything that I can talk to you. And she's like, 
oh yeah, sure, we can meet every week after Celebrate Recovery, da 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 And I was telling her, I was like, I'm so nervous to ask you. And, and then she gave me Joshua of how to have courage. Amen. And so in Joshua 6, verse um, 6 through 9, and just a little bit of the story of Joshua. Joshua was uh, like pretty, pretty much mentored under Moses. And Moses was supposed to bring the Israelites into the promised land after they were under the oppression of the Egyptians. So they left Egypt, and then they were in the wilderness. And then Moses was supposed to bring everyone to this promised land. Moses made an oopsies. God was like, no, not you no more. And then Joshua was the next person. And so Joshua had seen everything that Moses was doing. He pretty much assisted him. And so Joshua was the one to bring everyone into the promised land. And so here we have God speaking to Joshua. And he says, be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That is the word of the Lord. That is such a beautiful thing to read. To be there and the beauty of imagination, if we allow our imagination to roam, is to imagine being Joshua about to take over land that was already meant for him. We have promises that God has meant for you, for us, for each one of you here in this room. And we are consistently intimidated, possibly, from the the things that look big in our lives, the giants. And here we see God instructing this man to be strong and very courageous. Man or female, women, women is is also included in this, but to be strong and courageous and to not be frightened. And that's easier said than done. And I think that is the hard part because... um, when you are alone and facing your battles and facing your fears, when you have tormenting spirits, that is a thing, if you didn't know. <laughs> there are tormenting spirits, and even you see with Paul that there was a, a spirit that was sent to torment him. And that's where we read the verse before that my grace is sufficient enough for you, says the Lord. So we have these um, intimidations, we have these fears, whatever fears those might be, And we get into this extremely dark place. And that is when we are called to be courageous. Because it's easy to read it on a page, and it is different to apply it to our actual life. It's different to apply it when when it seems like there is no hope, when it seems like you're consistently failing, when you consistently feel like there's no one there to back you up. So... We we reflect on the word of God. We go back to scripture, community, prayer, the resources that God's provided for us. And we hold on to that hope, that hope that that God is with us and he will get us through. And it might not look the way we want it to look, but he will get us through. Another example that we have is Esther. And Esther is a really interesting book. And if you would like, and by the way, just for any others that are are like Alex, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, ESV. Um, So Esther 4, 13 through 17. And Esther is an interesting book because some scholars talk about how God isn't really mentioned in the book of Esther and how you don't really see much of his presence 
yet one will argue that the presence is in the, the, the practices of prayer and in fasting, and in the, the, the truth that the, the Jewish people b believed in God, and that's what distinguished them from the rest of society, is their belief in the Almighty God, Yahweh, Jehovah. Um, and so in Esther 4, um, 13 through 17, it reads, 13 mm -hmm, through 17, and um, just for a little context, Esther um, was chosen to be the next queen. And um, I'm just like, where, where are we again? I'm just like, what region are we in? I forget. Uh, four, four, three, uh, four, 13 through 17. Um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Well. I'm not quite sure, and it's okay. It's irrelevant to the point I'm trying to make. Um, but <laughs> basically, she was um, decided she was the next queen, and um, there was this other person that was the king's assistant or right hand man or something like that, who um, started to despise the Jewish people because of Esther's uncle or es Esther's family member, a family member named Mordecai. Um, who raised Esther, basically. And so Esther, Esther is in this uh, high position of power, even though she's a queen, she also doesn't have much power because it's, the king is, all, is the decision maker of everything. And um, Mordecai's in this predicament because his enemy, the, one of the king's assistants or, or second-hand man or whatever you may want to call it, the scholars, you can look it up. Um, we will tell you, but... He, he wanted to get rid of the Jewish people because of Mordecai. He didn't like Mordecai. He hated Mordecai. He was like, this person's insulting me. He doesn't bow down to me. I am this prestigious person, and who are you? Like, we rule you. You know what? Let's get rid of all of you. I don't even want to look at you or your people because it reminds me of how I hate you. And so Mordecai comes to Esther, and this is where the scene is where we are right now opening it up in the scene of the movie scene. Um, that's how I like to view things, um, of where Mordecai is coming to Esther to say, like, you are queen right now, but this man is, is out to destroy all of the Jewish people, and you are one of them, so do not think for a minute. You are not going to be affected by this. So we have in verse 13, all right, Alex? Um, then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do you not think to yourself that in the king's place or palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews? For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf. And do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it, 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 though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So here we see the Queen Esther making a decision to follow the voice of Mordecai. Someone that raised her up and someone that has had instructed her in how to live and how to, how to be in all the Jewish ways, perhaps. And she has to make a decision. Am I going to listen to this voice that I know has looked out for me my whole life and remember that? Or am I going to listen to the voice of, like, you might die? Are you sure you want to do that? The law says that you will perish if you take this step of faith. So if I'm Esther and I have these two, <laughs> two voices going on, I'm like, what am I going to do? And thanks be to God she listens to Mordecai, and she was fortunate to have that upbringing and that, um, that voice that was strong in her, in her heart to listen to him. 
and she goes and eventually she goes to the king and she petitions and and in faith she had that courage um to do what what you know she saw was best and god restored um all things and the jewish people are not only um redeemed from this situation they were also given an upper hand and an advantage and they were able to fight back the, their enemies and even, by law, um, take their belongings. And so it's a beautiful story in the book of Esther. And it's a story of courage. And it's a story of hope. And um, it's, it's something that is, is encouraging. So when, we, when you are in times of hardship, just remember that people um, before us have also walked those, those lines of hardship and have faced death, and um, have faced uncertainty. And we are in uncertain times, are we not? And uh, we don't know what's going to happen, and lots of horrible things are happening around us, and it is hard to hold on to that hope. It is hard to hold on to that light. Yet it is our um, free will, it is our choice to keep going back to God, and to keep tell it, like having the voices that are going to strengthen us and shutting off those voices or battling those voices or even just sitting with those tormenting voices and just being, being still and knowing that God is God. As he says, be still and know I am God. And if we reflect on his goodness and we reflect on the truth of who God is, <laughs> We are more than conquerors. We are, we, God has defeated death. Yes. He already went to hell for you <laughs> and for me. And the more you hold on to that truth and you believe it and you hold on to faith, faith without works is dead. So if we don't practice our faith, it, it is good as dead. And so it is, it is our responsibility to hold on. If anything, it's just to the grace of God, knowing that he has already defeated all our problems. God is bigger than our problems. I would like to turn it to you guys. I know we done, haven't done this um, weekly, but we were practicing it when we started back up after the pandemic. Um, and just a time of um, sharing or a time of reflecting. So just think of something difficult that you might be going through. Something you, that is holding you back from who you are destined to be. And maybe you don't believe you have a purpose. Maybe you don't believe you have anything destined in your life. And I'm here to tell you that um, you do. I'm here to tell you that it looks like peace, joy, restoration, bringing hope to others and love to others. Um, And do not be convinced otherwise. For Satan is a liar and he will tell you that you are worthless. He will tell you that there's no point. And he will attack your mind. And he will attack your situation. He will attack the people around you. And so you are here and you do have a purpose. And if, even if it is just to praise God, because he is worthy to be praised. So looking at these, these dark places in your life that you might have, be, have been avoiding or you're struggling with right now, What voice or feeling do you have that is pressing on you? What voice of the past or feeling that weighs on you or is chewing on you? That's question number one. What voice or word of God are you not listening enough to? How can you encourage yourself, edify and feed the spirit within you? What choices are you making? What choices can you make to grow closer to the truth of who you are of who God is, and about the people around you. And I will give us a couple minutes, maybe to, you can discuss with others, you can take a time of solitude um, and write it down or just pray about it and think on those those questions. Or even if a a word from God is given to you, you can read it and um, just gonna give a little bit of time for that so also those people online you can also take this time to reflect on those questions 
Um, again, it's like what vo voices or feelings are pressing on you. Um, what voices of our word of God are you not listening enough to? What choices are you making? And what choices can you make to grow closer to the truth of who you are, of who God is, and of those around you?
Awesome. Well, I hope some people had good reflections or conversations. Is there anything someone would like to share? I know online you guys are chatting, and it was great to, to read some of what you guys are saying. Um, I, will, I wanted to give like a pause moment. If there's anything on, on someone's heart, they're like, I really want to share something. I'm just going to give that moment right now. And if not, I'm not going to press anyone. I'm going to keep going. Any, anyone want to share something? We're good? Okay. All right. I'm going to keep going. So, <laughs> so I want to basically, um, so that, that kind of um, um, set of questions that I, I gave is something that I, I even ask myself. And it's something I I practice and have been practicing, and it's a consistency of practice that I I I, I make. Um, and with that, it's 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 going back to hope, and that is what I want to really leave everyone with is hope. <laughs> and um, so I'm I wrote something this morning that I'm just going to read to you. Um, and it was, it was beautiful because I was able to wake up and see hope this morning, and 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 it was beautiful and yet ordinary. Um, and that is something that God started to um, open up, like my imagination to, and it pointed to Him of how hope can look ordinary at times when it comes. And it might not look like what we expect it to look like. Um, it might not seem spectacular or glamorous and not exactly how we envisioned it. And Jesus, when he was here, Yeshua for his Hebrew name, Jesus Christ, looked ordinary. It was said, apparently, that he didn't look very handsome. And he was also from Nazareth, which apparently, you know, as one, put, one said, no, what, what good can come from Nazareth? And so he had that reputation. And um, yet here, here he was, the hope of the Hebrews, the hope of Israel. And it looked ordinary. <laughs> but it was only until people started to pursue that hope or look at that hope that they saw the miracles that were happening that they saw the blessings that were being poured out. And so the Messiah was Jesus Christ, all of their hope. And yet again, hope was a little bit disappointing. It was not exactly what their hearts expected. It wasn't what they envisioned. So they could accept the ordinary look, but then they had a difficulty accepting even how Jesus started to make parallels to cannibalism. What do you mean, drink my bl your blood and eat your flesh? Even at that, people started to leave. He's like, this guy is crazy. He's like, my hope does not look like that. The Messiah does not ask me to eat their flesh or drink their blood. <laughs> and even with that phrase, people left. And um, the Jewish people were severely oppressed by the Roman Empire, and they were ex extremely happy for the Messiah to come to conquer and to um, save them from their enemy. And so <laughs> we see that their hope was, again, a disappointment in some ways. Their hope was beaten. Their hope was ridiculed. Their hope was nailed to a cross. And that was a common torture back then from the Romans. Their hope was tortured, <laughs> their hope bled out, and their hope died. That is what happened to Jesus of Nazareth. He died on the cross, and that was the, the hope of many people. And so we, here we are thinking that your hope is snuffed out. And I'm telling you the story, but everyone knows the end, right? But if you sit in that situation right now, of seeing whatever hope you have today being snuffed out, being not what it was expected of, being um, beaten, being tortured, being trampled on, something that you've invested a lot of your time in, your life in, your heart, your tears, something that you are really hopeful for, and not seeing it come to pass, that's terrifying. 
and it's a very dark place to be in. So I'm sure some of you might have that. Some of you might have something they can relate to, especially in the nation as we are seeing catastrophes happen, that you see your hope gone. But, but thank God, right? But thank God. So the Israelites might have chosen to not believe in Jesus anymore, but then there are some that hold on to that faith and hold on to that hope. And three days later, their hope was resurrected and their hope was made alive again. <laughs> Even um, <laughs> for there were, there, were, there were people that saw Jesus and that hope that was resurrected, that hope that was alive, wasn't recognizable. So some of the disciples were walking and talking. They're like, oh, I don't know. You know, this what's going to happen. What's going to happen? What are we going to do? What's next? My hope is gone. And here comes Jesus next to them walking, asking them questions, challenging them. And it took them a minute. It took them a while, actually. It took them a long walk <laughs> to realize that was Jesus. We didn't recognize him. He didn't literally look the same. So hope can come in a form in your life today that doesn't look like what you expect it to look like. It might come in a different form. It might come in a way in which you have to let go of your picturesque desire of what it should look like. Maybe getting that job, maybe having financial freedom, maybe not having um, hardships with certain relationships. Or, or even not suffering a loss of someone dear to you. And, and that was a hope for you. And sometimes we have to let go of that and see that a new hope has been resurrected and it is alive and it's walking with you and talking with you and accepting that it looks different than what you had expected. But if you listen and if you hear, you will see how beautiful it is and how there's a bigger hope and it might not be here on earth right now, but that hope will come. And we will be with Jesus. We will be with our God and our Messiah. And we will not have tears, not have pain, not have suffering. And when we hold on to that hope, in the meantime, God will allow you to spread that hope to others. Spread life to others. Spread encouragement to others. Bestow grace and mercy to others because they might have just been like you, and they need a word from God, a word from you. God uses other people. He doesn't just speak directly always to us. He might use church. He might use friends. He might use even a stranger. He might even use someone that doesn't believe in him to tell you that he exists and that to tell you that he is there walking with you. So <laughs> um, I'm going to continue on with... Um, that I think I, I think I actually covered everything. <laughs> Sorry, I was like, I need everything written down because I'm going to freak out. Um, like I said earlier, when I started, I was very nervous. Um, so, I, so I wanted to, con to continue is that um, I, I, when I pause, I listen, I hear the spirit beckoning me to reality. The truth, the light of the hope that lives within me all else doesn't matter and doesn't compare. And when I chose, when I make that choice, to trust and put my hope in God, letting him take the wheel, letting go of what I want, what Kimberly wants, and surrendering it to him, knowing that he already knows my heart's desires. He already knows what is going to make me actually joyful, has anyone ever done that? Like you're at a, like at a restaurant and you're like, oh, I want that. And then someone else comes and they sit and you're like, no, I wanted that. Darn it. It's like we don't always know what we want. And even with something so simple as food. So what makes us think that we know what we need and want in our life? God knows it all. And so when we make the smart choice, the wise choice, and we listen to wisdom and hopefully gain understanding, we see that. Um, God has our best interests at heart, always. So, um, as I draw closer to him, holding on tight, because navigating through all the chaos, 
seems impossible to do alone. Instead, I put my hope in God, knowing God has already finished the race. Through grace, through his son, I am free. <laughs> and there is hope. So do not give up. Don't ever, 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 ever give up. <laughs> Love never fails. And if you'd like to put your hope in God, the three-in-one, Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, Yahweh, um, I would invite everyone to pray right now with me. And any hope that you have, any desire, any dream, anything that you are holding on tight to, let's surrender that to God and let him take the wheel. Uh, Father God, I thank you for this time that we have today. I thank you for the hope that you've given us through your son. I pray, Father God, that even though I may, may not be able to articulate the, the power and the immensity and the truth of it all, I pray that your spirit, Lord God, will plant seeds today in the hearts of the hearers and the listeners. I pray, Lord God, that if there is wounds in here or online or in the future of people that might listen to this later, that you would plant seeds of in, in this fertile soil, because you know when our heart is broken, when our heart is, is hurting and we let our barriers down, and when there is no hope, you are there, Lord God, ready, fully able, prepared to plant a seed of hope in us, to plant a seed of truth in us, to plant your Holy Spirit in us, and let it grow, Father God. So I pray that even though today is just a small amount of time in our lives, that it will be something that will nurture hope, it will nurture renewal of the mind, it will nurture and nourish, Lord God, and have us grow into a new being, a new creation, transforming into who you've already destined us to be and who you already have told us who we are, that we do not have a spirit of fear, but that we do have a spirit of love, power, and a sound of mind. And that we do go out there, and we are in a battle, we are in a warfare. We might not see it, Lord, but you do. So as we put our trust in you, Lord, as you are our eyes, Lord God, when we are in this field, in this battlefield, Lord, fighting, Lord God, for the lives of ourselves or, or the lives of others, Lord God, and their spirits, their hope, their souls, Lord God, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you take the wheel, that you take over and I pray, Father God, protection over um, the souls in this room for anything that Satan is trying to, um, to attack or even any self-destruction, any self-destruction, um, destroying habits, Lord God, that we've already implemented into our lives. I pray, Father God, that they will be dismantled. And I pray, Lord God, that a firm foundation will be laid so that we can start building a beautiful temple for you to reside in, Lord God. And whether it is a physical temple, Lord God, or spiritual one, I just pray in the mighty name of Jesus that we put our hope in you. We thank you for all these things. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, I know we don't have, like, any worship today, so, um, or any music, but... I mean, I can teach everyone a song if anyone wants to stand up. Yeah, I have like one song I would love to teach everyone. There's something that I was thinking of. Actually, I have like two songs, but because I'm, I think I'm over time, I'll, I'll stick to one. Um, let's see. So if um, everyone likes to stand up, just so we can get a little enthusiasm going. Um, I am not a professional singer, so that's okay. God is good anyways. Uh, <laughs> let's see. There's two songs, but let's see which one. There's one, um, let's see. There, okay, there's one that's called There's No One Like Jesus. And so it's pretty simple. You repeat it three, four times, except the last one you said there's no one like him. So it says, we go, there's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one like, no one like him. Okay, again, there's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like him. One more time, there's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like him. And then the second part goes, 
Um, I walked around here, there. I searched around here, there, and then I turned around here, there, and there's no one, there's no one like him. So it goes, I walked around here, there, I searched around here, there, I turned around here, there, there's no one, there's no one like him. Let's try that again. I walked around here, there, I searched around here, there, I turned around here, there, there's no one, there's no one like him. From the top, there's no one, there's no one like Jesus, there's no one, there's no one like him. There's no one like, no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like him. Second part. I walked around here, there. I searched around here, there. I turned around here, there. There's no one, there's no one like him. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'll be testing you guys next week on that one. Um, Joseph's, <laughs> yeah, jo I know, I, I should give a handout next time. Um, but hopefully next week, I do ask if they're, um, you know, going to the week this week, um, paying attention to the things that you've learned today, you know, see what you might be able to refrain from and things that you might want to go more towards. And um, also just think of the things that um, you might want to see in your life or you have seen in your life, a transformation that you've already experienced. And if there's any volunteers for next week to tell their story, I would love to see three hands go up. I mean, that's just a, a gamble. But if there's anyone, Chad, yes, thank you. I saw, I, I saw your hand. <laughs> Oh, you're working. I was like, I saw something move over there. Um, anyways, I'm no pressure, but maybe, I'll, maybe, maybe the time will come next week when um, we can um, share share stories share. or group share. Yeah, we can do that too. So thank you, thank you, Vivian. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Kimberly. You know, uh, one of my fun things uh, when I sit out in the audience is that when I have someone that comes up to speak and they say how nervous they are, um, Kimberly was even so transparent to say that she cried. You know, I sit back there and in my head I go, oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> because I know that's how God works. He works through us. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Kimberly. That was beautiful. Um, I have, let's see, an announcement. Uh, Pastor Jeff G. sent this to me this morning. And it says, uh, please remind the church, for those that have missed the past few Sundays, that we are now refinanced through WIF. So... Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Uh, you need to know that, you know, when I start my prayer sessions with the Lord, the first thing that I do say is, um, you know, I pray over our church and every church in San Francisco and beyond San Francisco. And man, every day I have said, you know, thank you, thank you, God, for blessing us with a financial miracle because I know it's his miracle. So thank you, thank you. With that, I want to say thank you to those that um, are able to give financially. Thank you for those that give to us through prayer um, and support. I am one person that truly believes that iron does sharpen iron. And you have seen one of my dear friends right here that sharpens me and pours into me spiritually. So I say thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Uh, we're still collecting the pledge cards for those that want to contribute in that manner. Thank you, thank you. Um, and uh, with that, I'm going to say if we can stand, those that are here, if you are on line and you can stand, let's stand and I'm going to lead us in the benediction. May the Lord bless you 
and keep you. May his gospel give you peace. May his spirit fill you with joy. May you be his disciples making disciples. May his face shine upon you. May you be 